to begin our time together. You can tell I have, I've lost my voice. I'm not sick as far as I know. I, I don't have COVID or anything else. But unfortunately, in light of my not having a voice, part of what I wanted to do during this half hour with you was to chant the O Antiphon, O Audience, uh, which is a very powerful O Antiphon. And it marks the solstice in its own way as well. So I'm going to have to let that go. But I believe that you can hear me okay. And we'll, uh, we'll build the time and space with other juiciness. So the passage that I put in the newsletter reads like this. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. <clears throat> There's the reminder at the end of this passage that Letting our light shine. Yes, it's the best choice that we can make for ourselves and for others. But letting our light shine is at the very heart and core of consciousness coming into form, of glory being given to God, of source reaching its fulfillment in creation. So there is something there about an imperative that if we are going to come into our fullness, if we are going to come into our wholeness, part of that process is letting our light shine. And that is a very active and engaging process. You could think about it in a very superficial way, such as uh, this kind of rising up, I'm just going to let my light shine. And that, that has depth to it too. Uh, but we could think of it just as something that we just flip a switch and we're just doing it. But when we really go to do it, when we really go to do it, what we find is that letting our light shine is really challenging. It, hit, it hits places of our own vulnerability. It hits places within ourselves that we didn't know existed. It plunges us onto a, a path and a territory of ourselves that maybe we haven't even faced directly or known about directly, letting our light shine means that we tap into the light at our very center. So think about it this way, even though it's immaterial. I'm gonna give a material example is, if you hone in and let's say your light is sitting at the very center of your physical being, like somewhere like in the center of your torso. If you begin to let that light really, really shine, that it's gonna shine through all the other parts of yourself. That it means, that it is shining through all the cells and all the different parts of the body. It means that it's shining through all of the unseen or unconscious parts of the self. It, it is an, an integral part of awakening that this light shines through all of this. And as it shines through all of this, then it shines out for all the world. So it is not spiritual bypassing, which is a popular phrase these days. It is not uh, showing forth goodness uh, in spite of something, but it is all in light of something. And there's another line in these inspired texts that, that, that says, the secret thoughts of many will be laid bare. And then there's another line in another part of this inspired text that says, 
nothing that is done in secret will go unknown. That that which is behind closed doors will be made evident. So that even when we do goodness and it's unseen or unrecognized, it, it is recognized actually uh, in ways we don't see, but it will be recognized as well. So there's something very powerful about this notion of letting our light shine in the process. And it brings me to the second part of this reflection. And that is, and it's come up a lot of times in our meetings and in things that I do for the group, this whole play of dark and light. So yesterday was the longest amount of darkness leading to this light to the solstice day. And so there is something connected there that the longest light of the longest amount of darkness then leads to the light now growing. There is something of a coming to the point of the, the greatest darkness and then giving way to light coming more and light coming more and light coming more. There's something that's not to be dismissed about that. And in that, we find then an interesting opportunity to recognize that within our very selves, we have aspects that we might consider dark and aspects that we might consider light. And if you were to have to write down on a piece of paper, what parts of you are dark and what parts of you are light, what would you write? What would you say? Would they be observations about yourself? Would they be aspects of what you know and you don't know? What would be your position on the dark and light of yourself? So let's say you took the dark and light of yourself to be like this. My light is my kindness to all people. My dark is the, are the times that I get very impatient and act out on that impatience. Let's say you were gonna look at things you know and you describe them as light and dark. Wouldn't it be then, if you were to step back even a little bit further, wouldn't it be then that even that light, that ability to be kind to all, that there, that there, that is coming from a place that is light filled. It's like the fruit. It's not the source of the light, but it's the fruit of the light that's leading you into that ability or capacity to show kindness to all people or goodness to all. And if you look at the impatience, if you peeled back the onion a bit, couldn't it be that there's a part of you that is uh, in need of healing or unrecognized or ignorant or not yet fully filled with light that is behind the impatience? And therefore the dark wouldn't so much be the impatience, the impatience might be the, the unfortunate fruit of the dark that is underneath it, that is unresolved. Where then does that take that inquiry for you? And when we look at dark and light in the world, could we reframe these parts of ourselves in this way? <clears throat> let's say you're out on an evening where the stars are bright and the moon is, is big and full and you're sitting out on an open land. And you could say that you're sitting in darkness. Now we could argue it scientifically to say, it's not really dark, right? There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of activity going on on the energy level that is emitting light. But nonetheless, for for the sake of the image, in a way you're sitting in the dark. And then if you were sitting in that same spot in the noonday sun, you might say you're sitting in the light, right? Because the sun is bright. Absence of the sun, presence of the sun. But what might be other ways that you refer to that when you look out on the land? 
Is there something in the night that seems a bit more silent or quiet? And in the noonday sun, is there something on the land that seems a bit more busy, uh, more maybe more sound going on? Maybe there's more brightness. So these images are interesting because if we even take that a little bit further, well, in the silence and the quiet, is there then nothing going on? And in the, the brightness of the noonday sun, is there everything going on? I think we find that we stop short at the qualities, the quiet and the silent, the busy and the bright, that when we step to that deeper question, we find that in both what we observe as dark and light, that there is always something going on. What is that always something that is going on? Hmm. That's very powerful. I don't know about you, but I find my, my body's welling up with some emotion around that. I'm not sure about you. But to rest into the experience that there's always something going on. <clears throat> it connotes to me that there is always a a sounding that's going on, a divine sounding, a, a good work, the ineffable presence. There's always a presence that's active and moving, going on. And if that is so, if that is so, that even in these qualities, when we step back into the experience, and again, this is my truth, so it's for you to discover your truth. If in the experience of these qualities, we then come to a common denominator that there's always something going on. In what way does that knowing set us free? Does it free us from reaching for something? Does it free us from avoiding something? Leave it with that inquiry right there so that each one of us can take that where it's meant to go for us. And let's take a minute in silence to just sit, to sit with that, those descriptors, those qualities, those questions. Let's sit together in a sacred circle on that. So for today's meditation, we're going to do something that we've done together before. I don't believe that we've done it on this Advent series, but we've done it together in other contexts. And that is a, a light meditation from the solar plexus. So if you are aware of your chakras or not, and there are many more than the seven that we call the major, um, you may or may not know that the third chakra along the spine, the third chakra a few inches above the belly button is the solar plexus. And that is the seat of identity, the seat of I. 
the seat of I, identity. <clears throat> your sense of yourself in the world, your sense of self, capital S. And I think the way that we come into our own, where we are free and masters of who and what we are, is when the self, small s, merges with the self, capital S, and there's an intermingling that stabilizes so that the individual self is moving in and from the capital S self. So this meditation is a certain activation of that for us. And we're going to focus upon the light quality of the energy of the chakra. So yesterday we did a chakra meditation that was all color. This is light. And you're going to key into the breath in this chakra. So it's like a tornado, a vortex of energy coming out the front. That is the feeling center of the eye energy. And coming out the back, that is the will center of the eye energy. And in, in that energy there, you are coming into wholeness. So there's, a, there's part of you that is just universal life source and you are whole. There's nothing you can do to take away that reality. And then there are other parts of you that aren't quite aligned to that yet. It's like being a great instrument and the instrument holds within it all the power of the great music, the ineffable music. But part of it may be in tune and part of it may be out of tune. So we're going to let the light source that's at the center of this chakra move through our being to fine tune and heal and activate the self, you and I, to be the light in the world. And in this, the light shines to be a balm to all the places within ourselves that are could be scared of the light, are unknown, are unhealed, and all the places that are just brimming to shine out and are looking to be amplified. And there are other places that are shining out, and this would just simply add strength to that. All right, <laughs> so I invite you to close your eyes. and bring your focus to the solar plexus. If you wish, you can take one or other hand and place it on the plexus just above the belly button. If that helps you bring your awareness to that point. And breathe in and out of that point. And as you brought the breath down into that point, see if you can breathe entirely from this place, inhaling, expanding from this point of the solar plexus, exhaling, contracting back. Contraction, remember, is a concentration of energy. It's very powerful, just as powerful as the expansion. They work in tandem. Breathe from this place.
And now as you continue to focus upon the breath, <clears throat> become aware that there is a light at the center. So at the center of the breath and the solar plexus, there is a light. And it is your light, but it is the light of the uncreated as well. It is a pulsing light. Become aware of this light. And with every breath, if it has not happened spontaneously already, let this light grow, moving in every direction, filling every cell. Allow it to be released from the solar plexus, from the center of the breath here. <coughs> And with the breath, let this light magnify beyond the physical body very slowly. Let it ebb its way into your etheric energy body, into the energy body that is you that exists two to three inches from the physical body. Let it emanate, emanate and fill that part of you. Allow the light to emanate even further, about six inches from the body. Let it intensify. Let it move through all parts of yourself, that part of you that you know, and that part of you that you do not know.
and allow this light to move outward even further through the energy that is you, as far as you can perceive spontaneously that your own energy extends outward. It could be very close to the physical body, it could be very wide, just on every breath, release the light and know that the group is sustaining and supporting you. And now with every breath, allow this light at the center of your being to extend beyond you, rippling out effortlessly to all the world. And in this light <clears throat> that we are, we bring our meditation to a close. I invite you to bring your palms together in front of your heart and to give a slight bow before this light. This slight bow. I bow before the spirit within, the light that shines in my heart. You bow to the spirit within, the light that shines in your heart. And when we meet in this place, we are one. 
When you are ready, open your eyes. Great to be with you. All right, great to be with you. Great to be in a place that has Starbucks Wi-Fi, which extends probably a mile in every direction of, of, the, of the store. So today's topic is the spirit and the bride say come. And the focus of today's meditation is being prepared, being prepared for the awakening to happen. So in our journey in self-realization, I'm sure each one of us can attest to the fact that we have certain desires that arise within ourselves. So a desire to uh, have contentment, a desire to live from a place of wisdom, a desire to be illumined at all times. We have all of these desires that find their origin in the soul, for the soul is meant and intended for this quality of life and living. And we find simultaneously with these desires that not always, but probably frequently enough to mention, there is a gap between the fullness of that desire taking place within us and where we are at in the present moment. And so awakening anew is the process of the part that is longing unfulfilled realizes or becomes fulfilled in that very desire. And I love for the languaging around this to be like bride and bridegroom. Not that one's the bride and one's the bridegroom, but rather that it points to the dance that's taking place within ourselves and the ultimate union with the beloved, the lover and the beloved, the bride and the bridegroom, the ultimate union that happens as we awaken fully anew. And when I was looking at, I wanted the topic spirit and the bride say come, and I was looking at two different passages. The passage I chose not to use was the passage where the all of the virgins, well, in the story, there are 10, but there are 10 virgins who have lamps who are waiting for the bridegroom. And in the story, five of them made sure they had enough oil and the other five did not. And the bridegroom was delayed in coming. They fell asleep. They had their lamps lit. And then with their lamps uh, burning at a certain point, the bridegroom shows up and what happens? The five that made sure they had enough oil, their lamps are lit. And the five that did not have enough oil, their lamps went out and they couldn't greet the bridegroom. So I was, I was torn between that passage and the passage that I chose for similar, they both pull upon similar angles to the theme of being prepared for this awakening anew. And let me refer first to that story, and then I'll jump into what was in our newsletter. So you could read that story in a very superficial level and say, wow, right? It's, it's like a, almost a punitive measure. Well, you didn't have enough oil, so what? You lose. <laughs> and then it could seem almost mysteriously selfish that the ones with enough oil would not share with the ones that did not have enough oil but it points to the fact that they needed their oil for themselves. But when we, we look a little more deeply to that, the oil represents what? The preparation. And every person is responsible for their own preparation in relationship to God. Every single one of us. And therefore, how much oil we have of reserve is completely up to us alone with the beloved to be prepared in order to be prepared. 
But look at what the passage is also pointing to is the fact that the preparation wasn't that these virgins went out looking for the bridegroom, didn't try to fulfill the desire, but just that they had enough oil that the light would be strong enough that they would be able to meet the bridegroom when the bridegroom showed up. So that shows that preparation is really an, an inner work, if you will. Now, in the passage that's in the newsletter, it's got uh, a lovely couple references here. So Jesus is being asked by some various spiritual leaders, church leaders, why, why his disciples don't fast and why John the Baptist's disciples fast. And Jesus points out that those that are with him are fulfilled. You fast in order to be prepared for something, but what they were preparing for is in their presence, and that's being with him. So there's no preparation needed, and the fact that they're with him shows that they did whatever preparation was needed for that illumination to take place. But then he goes further to talk about what is involved in this, and I'm going to use their closeness to Jesus as just the general state of awakening into union with the beloved. So they're not fasting because they're in union and that in union is showing forth because they're with Jesus. So let's just look at that as the general process of awakening, whether it's uh, Christocentric for you or not, whether you use the word Jesus in that process or not. Well, Jesus gives a little bit more insight into this. <clears throat> he says, no one sews a patch of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. And neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they did, the skins would burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. You pour new wine into new wineskins. So what I believe the lesson is here for us today is the question of in our inner preparation for awakening, in our inner preparation, what within us is a condition that no longer serves. What is an old wineskin? What is a lamp without oil? But we're, we're holding on to it. And what conditions are being called forth so that the new wine can show up and be poured into us so that the awakening can happen anew so that when the bridegroom comes, we are lit up enough that we are ready. We are ready ready, ready. So we're talking about the conditions, what conditions within us no longer serve us, what conditions are being called forth. Now I have referred to these conditions, this idea numerous times in other things that we've done. And I first went deep in this inquiry through a book, uh, written by uh, Janet O'Connor called The Lotus and the Lily. And in that book, she quotes the Buddha as saying, when the conditions are right, manifestation happens. So you see, when the conditions are right, we can't not manifest. We can't not awaken. So what we want to look at is not so much focusing only on the desires of our soul that we're not in yet and the gap, but we want to focus on what conditions are being called forth uniquely right here and right now so that awakening can happen. Conditions can vary. For instance, they can be the choice, the knowing that you're meant to meditate daily. They could be the knowing that you're meant to let a relationship go in your life or the knowing that you're meant to say yes to a certain relationship or friendship. They could be on that level. They could be around time management. 
they could be around other forms of self-care like that. But most often, they, they do involve that, but most often they also involve other ways of becoming a new wineskin. And what would that be? A new form of trust. A new commitment to audacity in your spiritual life. A new form of inquiry that doesn't circle around the same patterns, but asks new questions, yielding new answers. So those are samples of conditions. And what I would love to invite you to do right after this meditation or at some other point for yourself is take a look at what you need to do and be and choose in order to be lamp full with plenty of oil, new wine skin, so the awakening can happen. And when you take a look at this, even when you're looking at like a union with the beloved or a fulfillment of a certain desire, if that desire is somehow representative of a bridegroom, what image is conjured up for you? What, what are some of your implicit and explicit beliefs around this? That is a very, very juicy inquiry. All right. So our, our condition preparation today, our choosing to have a big stock of oil for our lamp and our choosing to become a new wineskin is going to be a chakra meditation. And we're not going to use sound. Oftentimes I use sound with chakra meditations. Today we are going to use color. All right, why color? Or what does color have to do with it? <clears throat> All vibrations and frequencies have a certain tone to them that is a color. So when you look at colors in a rainbow or colors on a spectrum, if you were to break it down into frequency and waves, you would see that there is a, a different uh, frequency that's happening. And that frequency correlates with the color that you see. So the, the color red has a different frequency in energy in this world than the color blue has. And the color green has a different frequency than the color purple has. So when we do a chakra meditation with color, what we're doing is we're allowing the frequency of the color itself to wash our field so that we can be the new wine skin, so that the conditions are ripe for manifestation and awakening. And if you have studied the chakra system, you will know that for the major chakras, the root chakra is red, the sacral or second chakra is orange, the solar plexus or third chakra is yellow, the heart chakra is green, the throat chakra is a crystal blue, the third eye or sixth chakra is indigo blue, and the crown is purple or white. And this while it is generally true that the way our chakras operate, that's the color frequency that's happening. These are not hard, fast rules. I have found when I have been an agent of color healing that oftentimes colors will come to me that don't correlate with the area of the body that may be the point of focus. For instance, I was I was doing some training and some healing work and I was working with a partner and we were called to do psychic healing on each other. And what that was, was we, we sat in silence and one was the receiver and one was the giver. And you just simply had to follow your intuition and do a healing for that person, but notice the images or anything that comes up. And <clears throat> what happened with this man was I was sitting there and this part of his neck kept coming up really strong. But what also came up strong with it was like a, a thick red orange with just a little yellow, like an oil based paint was coming up to smear on that area. And so I followed 
my sensing on this and I smeared it in my mind's eye. I kept smearing this red orange oil based paint like uh, energy with a little bit of yellow on this part that if you went literal would be crystal blue indigo blue area. And as I finished that healing afterwards, we both opened our eyes and he was freed of a pinched nerve that was in his neck. So he had walked into that session and that uh, time of learning with that going on that was causing him great pain. So we don't want to be rigid with the color and make it like rules that we have to follow, but we want the color itself to uh, be fluid and to follow. So I'm going to prompt you with color. And as you allow the color and the chakra to become larger and amplify, if other colors are coming in or other things are happening, follow that, follow that guidance. Okay. This is fun, right? So we are preparing the conditions by washing all parts of the energy bodies and by igniting new ways of being. So I invite you to close your eyes. And bring your attention to the root chakra at the base of the spine a whirling vortex that extends downward to the center of creation and that vibrates with the color red, deep blood red. Bring your focus here and become aware of that frequency color of blood red. And now let your entire physical body, all the cells, be washed in this blood red. And let the extended energy bodies of you be washed in that blood red as well. So that you are vibrating in and swimming in this red. Now move the gaze upward to the second chakra, the sacral chakra, about three or four inches below the belly button. Two main vortices, one extending forward, outward, and one extending backward, outward, and vibrating to the color of brilliant gold uh, orange, a warm orange. Become of this region of your body, vibrating to this orange. And extending through all the body, physical and energy bodies. You are swimming in a brilliant orange. Notice feelings and sensations. And 
through the gaze upward to the solar plexus or third chakra a few inches above the belly button with its two vortices, one moving out the front, one in the back and vibrating to a piercing golden yellow. Let every cell of the body be washed in this yellow. And let all the energy bodies that are you be refreshed and washed in this yellow as well. You are immersed entirely in the frequency of the solar plexus yellow. Move the focus upward to the heart and the heart chakra. Vibrating the frequency of emerald green. Let every cell be filled with emerald green. Be washed. Let all the extended energy bodies be washed in emerald green. Move the focus up to the throat, the throat chakra, crystal blue. And sense the two vortices of this crystal blue extending outward, the front and the back. And let the chakras open wide. And this crystal blue move effortlessly like a waterfall through the physical body through the emotional and mental bodies, through the entire subtle energy bodies that make up you. Move the focus <clears throat> up to the third eye, the sixth chakra, where the front vortex is situated between the eyebrows and the forehead. And the back is the manis that extends outward just below the occipital ridge of the skull. And this vibration is indigo blue. Open the third eye. Allow the indigo blue frequency that carries the pure energetic of the third eye. Allow it to move through the cells and through all your subtle energy. To move the focus up to the crown chakra that extends 
upward, matching the root chakra downward. It vibrates with a frequency primarily of purple and white. Allow the chakra to open wide and flood all the systems that make up you. Flood them with light and love. Renew your focus and notice how this energy moves and enlivens the cells and washes through all the subtle energy bodies, healing what no longer serves and letting grow all that that will create you ready for awakening. Now, as we slowly bring this meditation to a close, let your inward gaze just move from the crown down to the root very simply and gently, allowing all the colors to be present, allowing yourself to be washed, washed by the energy that's moving through you. Once you reach the root, move the toes back and forth and wiggle the fingers and bring the palms together in front of the chest, keeping the eyes closed. Bow before the beauty of you, the divinity of you. When you are ready, open your eyes with Namaste. Namaste, my friends. Great to be with you. See you tomorrow.